Good morning, and welcome back to another session here at the Kentucky Tennessee Camp Meeting. It's good to see each and every one of you here. Uh, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us all here this morning. Thank you for the message that you're going to deliver through your servants. Uh, be with him, fill him with your Holy Spirit. Be with us as we listen. Help us to hear the message that you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, at this time, uh, we will hear from Pastor Vinny. You all know him. He's been here all week. He's been sharing dynamic messages. And uh, I hope that you will listen and that God will speak through him today. Pastor Vinny. Good morning once again. Can I just take a moment and tell you what you already know? And... By taking a moment and telling you what you already know, I just want to tell you what a great conference you are and what a pleasure it has been to be with you this week, to preach with you this week, to pray with you this week. The people uh, have had side conversations with me and, and, and just came and encouraged me. You know, I am the type of personality that is always going, 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 going. And this week has been a treasure to me. Amen. This week has recharged me. Amen. This week have put me in contact with people that I would never probably meet in, in the kind of urban ministry I do. And I'm just really thankful for my time with you and the love and support you have shown me. And I just want to say, you guys are a great, great conference, and you have great leaders, and God bless you. I'm, I, I know I have so many new faces I'm going to be praying for when I leave here. That said, I want to tell you about my podcast. You can see it here, Simply Devotion. You can find it on Spotify, you can find it on iTunes, you can find it on Google Podcasts, you can find it on Amazon. And my podcast is simply a podcast about Jesus. And I just want to make you aware of it because some of you have asked where you can find more of my messages. My podcast, I have a co-host. His name is uh, Dr. Jonathan Martin. And in my podcast, we our whole goal of our podcast, Simply Devotion, is to just elevate the theology a little bit higher than you would hear in the normal sermon. So it will edify you, it will teach you, you will, you will learn a lot, and I just want to let you know about it. I haven't pushed it all week, but on my last day, since so many of you have come up to me and asked me how you can find more of my messages, I just want to tell you, whatever platform you'd like to look for it on, you can just put simply devotion into Google and you will find us. My last message to you is going to be about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. My first message to you was about God's grace being sufficient. And then my second message to you was about because God's grace is sufficient, he can send you into the prisons to set the captives free. And then my third message to you was about the impact of trauma. And we looked at Job's wife. And my third, my fourth message to you was about grit. And grit being the way that we answer trauma. Holding on to the promises of God. But today, I want to talk to you about suiting up for spiritual warfare. Because one thing you can be assured of, <laughs> Jesus is coming. It's about time, as your camp meeting theme says. But we have to endure to the time, as I've been telling you about. But as we endure, we will face spiritual warfare. I don't know if any of you sp face spiritual warfare. I have. I will again, and you will too. So let's talk about 
how Paul dealt with spiritual warfare. Now, when we talk about Paul, there are some key churches that are, are like massive enterprises for him, you know. And we've talked about the Corinth church in one of our messages. And we've talked about Philippi, that's where the jailer was, in one of our messages. And today we're going to talk about Ephesus. Now, if you look at Ephesus, it's on the province of Galatia. And you can see that it's around the Mediterranean Sea. And that's important to us to understand about Ephesus because it's in the heart of a seaport place. And Ephesus is one of the larger cities that Paul will do ministry in. Ephesus is an influential city. A city of wealth. A city of immense population. Look at the stadium in Ephesus. I mean, this is in the first century. This stadium rivals stadiums we have now. This was a big city with lots of people, lots of influence, lots of money, lots of merchants. There was all kinds of things in Ephesus. And so God called Paul there. There was also a temple in Ephesus, and that's significant to understand. It was the temple of Artemis. Artemis is the Greek goddess that you probably know better as the goddess Diana from the Greco-Roman period. So Ephesus was a city of influence. Ephesus was a city of wealth. Ephesus was a city of, of trade, and it was a major port, but it was a hot spot for paganism as well. And so Paul finds himself ministering in this place of influence, this place of money, this place of population, and this place of the giant world-famous temple of Artemis. So as Paul goes into Ephesus, Paul is trying to figure out, how do I minister to these people who are so different than I am? How do I minister to these people who, who have this different religion than I do? who have more money and influence than I do. Well, Paul has a system that he uses. And there's also a synagogue in Ephesus. And Paul's intrinsic way of doing ministry, Paul's contextualized way of doing ministry, is to go to the places in his territory that he goes into that have the most in common with him. And so you will see over and over as you read the book of Acts that one of the first things Paul does, even though Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, he doesn't start his ministry at Artemis' temple. You will find over and over Paul makes friends with those he has the most in common with. And he starts in the synagogue. He starts with those who know Shabbat Shalom, happy Sabbath, or peaceful Sabbath. He starts with those he has something in common with. And he builds roots and he builds connections. And then he uses those friendships to be introduced to other people in other places. He contextualizes builds friends, builds relationships. For Paul, in Ephesus, there's a duality. There is, on the one hand, a hot spot of darkness, a temple, a gigantic temple, one of the largest temples in, in, in Greece, the, the temple of Artemis. On the other hand, though, there are believers in the synagogue of the one true God. We know the one true God is Yahweh. And Paul knows that Jesus is the one true God. 
And so Paul builds his relationships, even though there's differences, even though there's points of disagreement, and we're going to look at those. Paul starts building these friendships. Now understand something here. Paul understands what's at stake. And I want you to understand what's at stake. In my last presentation to you, please, please understand what's at stake. We live in a time when it is about time for Jesus to come. We live in a time when we need to witness to whoever will listen about the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul understood the seriousness of his time and the seriousness of the importance of Ephesus. In fact, Paul spent the most time of his whole ministry in Ephesus. This is why we're going to talk about spiritual warfare in Ephesus. Paul, who is arguably the most important evangelist with the exception of Jesus himself, spent his longest time in the place that had the most pagan roots. Paul spent three full years in Ephesus. And he only left Ephesus when he felt God calling him to leave Ephesus and to enter into a time where he would end up being persecuted and going to Rome and eventually being killed. Ephesus was Paul's last stop on the way to Paul's end. He would leave Ephesus, go to Jerusalem, and be arrested. And so will start his journey to Rome. So Paul sees Ephesus as this place that he must invest in. Where is your place? Where is your place? What do I mean by that? I mean, where is your Ephesus? Where is the place that if this is your last stand, if, if this is God's last stand in your life, where is that place he's calling you to? It doesn't need to be a city. It doesn't need to be a town. It could be your work. It could be a family member that you know is in darkness. It could be a ministry to the homeless or, or, or a ministry to veterans or a, a ministry to the blind. I don't know. But every one of us must have an Ephesus if it's about time. There is lots of art temples of Artemis out there, isn't there? If this is the season of your life, that God is calling you to do spiritual warfare for him. Where is your Ephesus? Paul found his Ephesus. Paul built other believers up in his Ephesus. Paul opened his heart up to God in Ephesus. And I want you to hear what we're going to see here. Ephesus is a place of duality. Ephesus is a place where Paul can find people he has things in common with. But it's also this place where there's this intense darkness. But it's also this place that he knows that if he trusts God, God will do incredible things in his Ephesus. Do you have a place where there's great darkness? But you believe God is calling you to do the best things you have ever done yet. It's there. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't matter to me what season of life you're in. It doesn't matter to me if you're a young adult. It doesn't matter to me if you're a senior citizen. It doesn't matter to me if you're retired or working. It doesn't matter. We all have an Ephesus. God is calling us to do spiritual warfare on the behalf of those who are trapped 
in places of influence. And so, Acts 19, verse 11 says something really incredible. It said, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. What did he do? Which one of you has God done a miracle through? God didn't just do a miracle through Paul. Are you hearing me this morning? This is my last time. I'm not, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm pressing upon you because, because God didn't just do a miracle for Paul. I want you to understand that there's no difference between you and Paul. What God did in Paul's life, God would do in your life. What God did in Paul's Ephesus, God would do on your Ephesus. Maybe not the exact same way as in Paul's, but I want to tell you something. God doesn't want to just do miracles in your life. He wants to do extraordinary miracles in your life. Paul is in his last season of ministry. And God calls Paul not just to everyday miracles, but to extraordinary miracles. Because God knows the importance of letting the people who are in darkness, surrounded by the temple of Artemis, to know that there is a God in heaven who is more powerful than Diana. See, some of us don't even believe in miracles. Some of us, we enter into spiritual warfare and we go up against just, just a little bit of resistance and we're afraid. But God is not interested in Simple miracles, easy miracles, half-hearted miracles. If you would believe in God like Paul did, God wants to do extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary miracles through you. And verse 12 goes on to say that even... So that even, like, look at this. This is mind-blowing. So that even the handkerchiefs and the aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. And their illnesses were what? Cured. And evil spirits left them. That's what spiritual warfare is about. That even in the place of the temple of Diana, even in the place of the temple of Artemis, that God's power could be so clear, that God's power could be so strong, that God's power could be so present because somebody was willing to be the recipient of extraordinary power. Have you ever heard of such a thing? This is casting out demons by remote. This is healing the sick by remote. It's one thing if I go to a dear sister's house or a dear brother's house and I anoint them with oil and I gather the elders around and I pray and, and I encourage them and they're healed and we all will say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But because Paul opens himself up, because Paul wants to see extraordinary things happen for Jesus, His handkerchief, his apron, and we might say tie today, cast out 
demons. And made the sick well. It's about time. It's about time. Isn't that your theme? It's about time that the God of Paul, it's about time that the God of John, it's about time that, uh, that the God of Peter, it's about time that the God of Matthew display his powers again in this world. But there is no more John, and there is no more Matthew, and there is no more Paul. There is just us. Who will stand in Ephesus? Who will even ask, where is my Ephesus? Who will be bold enough to go to Ephesus? Who will believe in miracles? Who, who, who will believe in extraordinary, what kind? Extraordinary. extraordinary miracles. God has not changed, only his people have. Oh, that God's people would return to primitive godliness like Paul. That they would claim their Ephesus, that they would walk right up to the cities of darkness and say, God, use me to do extraordinary things. Now, listen, listen. When you start opening yourself up to God to do extraordinary things, not, not for your sake. Not because you're important. Not because your, your name is important or, or your personality is important. But because Jesus Christ loves the people who are trapped in darkness. Amen. When you start doing that, expect there to be war. When you invade the devil's territory, expect there to be war. And I'm here to tell you what to do when you get to war. I'm here to tell you how to win the war. How to win the war is to lead out of the power of Jesus. <laughs> to, to spend time with Jesus. To, to, to know Jesus. So, so, so that even, listen, listen to what you're going to see here. So that even the powers of darkness fear you, not because of you. Because it's, they've seen you with Jesus. Watch, some Jews, they got jealous of Paul and his extraordinary miracles. They got jealous that he was winning Ephesus. And they went around driving out evil spirits trying to be like Paul. They were copycat Pauls. And they drove evil spirits and they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they would say, listen to what they say. Listen, it's just, it's just so good. It's just so good. <laughs> They're just like, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches about. Like, they don't know Jesus. They know Paul, and they know what Paul does, but they don't know Jesus. The question, if you're going to go do spiritual warfare, is do you know Jesus? Because it is about who you know. They don't know Jesus, and so they're like, in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches about, I command you to come out. <laughs> The seven sons of Sceva were out there. <laughs> the, the Jewish chief priest's sons, they were out there one day. And the evil spirits from Artemis 
the evil spirits in Ephesus. The evil spirits from Diana's temple came after them. The evil spirits tested them. And listen to what the evil spirits said. Jesus I know. Paul I know about. But who are you? Jesus I know. Paul I know about. But who are you? You see, they don't fear these Jewish leaders. The darkness doesn't respect these Jewish leaders. Because the darkness knows who you spend time with. They know Paul. They see Paul with Jesus. They're like, we're not messing with Paul. He spends time with Jesus. When Paul comes around casting people out, we're getting out of the way because Paul spends time with Jesus. You see, the problem is we have people who want to go to war against spiritual forces, but they don't spend any time with Jesus. Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. You want to take down the temple of Artemis. You have to be one who spends time with Jesus. Don't play. Don't play. Don't play or you're going to get beat up. Sometimes I wonder if the reason we get so beat up is because we're playing around. And we come up to evil forces in our life and they're like, we know Jesus, we know the pastor, we know the deacon, we know the elder, but who are you? If you want to invade Ephesus, if you want to take down a temple of Artemis that is shining in your community, you've got to spend time with Jesus. Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. Jesus is the power that overcomes the temple in Ephesus. Jesus is the God who crushes Diana. And the darkness in Ephesus respects Paul because the darkness sees Paul with Jesus. So Paul goes on to say, became, this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus. And they, they what? They were all seized with fear. And the, and the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord Jesus, was held in high honor. Do you want your families to honor Jesus? Do you want your communities to honor Jesus? Do you want your churches to honor Jesus? Then spend time with Jesus. Let the darkness fear you. Flee from you. Because you spend time with Jesus. 
Paul stayed his longest amount of time of any place in Ephesus. I told you, at least three years. And you know what happens after Paul leaves Ephesus? He warns them that savage wolves are going to come. You know why? Because darkness will always come running back in when spiritual people leave. So you have to spend time with Jesus, you have to cast the darkness out, and you have to leave leaders in place that also spend time with Jesus. Now you may recognize the name Ephesus for more than Acts. You may recognize the name Ephesus for from, from more than the book of Ephesians. You may recognize the name Ephesus from the book of Revelation as the first church listed in the book of Revelation. You know why? Because God saw what Paul started in Ephesus, and you know who became the pastor after Paul? John. It's where 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John were written. When people covet to spend time with Jesus, Jesus brings strong lights to your community. If you will do spiritual warfare with Jesus, if you are willing to bring down the temples of Diana and your world for Jesus, Jesus will provide strong leadership for you. Paul writes back to them and he says, this is about spiritual warfare. Paul writes back to them in his book of Ephesians, in his letter of Ephesians, and he's like, this is about spiritual warfare. Paul writes back to them and Paul is like, listen, I told you savage wolves will come. What are you doing? What are your leaders doing? What are you doing? How are you holding the fort down? Paul writes back to them and he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his what? Oh, I'm alone today. What kind of miracles did Paul do in Ephesus? Extraordinary. What does Paul expect them to do when he's gone? Have mighty power. God don't want you to have power. God don't want you just to do miracles. He wants you to do extraordinary miracles. He doesn't want you just to have regular power to get through the day. It's a hard day at work. I made it through. I got home and I had a good night's sleep. And, you know, I, no, 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 no. He wants you to have mighty power. He wants you to suit up for spiritual warfare. He doesn't want you to be the victim. He wants you to be the power lifter. Paul writes back to them after he's gone. He's like, finally, be strong. Don't be okay. I'm not interested in just okay. I'm not interested in I just made it through the week. Paul says, listen, it's about time. If we're at the end, if it's about time, you, you told me you believe it's about time, right? Paul is saying, if you really believe Jesus is coming, if you really believe it's about time, well, 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 what? Well, finally, be strong. Be strong. Don't live to the end if it's about time. Be, finally, be strong in the Lord. Be not just powerful, be what? Be mighty in power. Paul says, put on the full armor, not part, not part. Don't go out half naked. You know who was naked? Those people who got beat up by the demons. That's why he says, don't be naked. Naked people get beat up by the demons. They think they got power, and they go out, and they try to take down the temples of Artemis, and they get beat up. Paul says, have real power. Get fully dressed. Don't go out in no bathrobe. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against what? 
You, you see what you're fighting in these last days, right? That you may take your stand against the devil and his what? His schemes. Paul says, suit up for war. Paul says, don't go fighting demons in the bathrobe. Paul says, the way you do spiritual warfare is by putting on the full armor of God. Paul says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Paul says, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Paul says, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Paul says, in addition to all of this, take up the what? The shield. Oh, because you know when you do spiritual warfare, the devil is going to be firing darts at you. Paul says, take up the shield of faith for which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You see, when you do spiritual warfare, the evil one is not just shooting arrows at you. He's shooting arrows at you that are on fire. Paul says, put on the helmet of salvation, you got to have this right. You got to have this right. You got to have this right. You got to have your head right with Jesus. You got to know how salvation works. You got to be secure in Jesus. You go out there half naked and you're going to get beat up by the evil forces in Artemis. Paul says, get it right in your head. Take up the helmet of salvation, and then what? What? I almost heard you that time. The sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. You realize in this whole thing about spiritual warfare, this is the first time he mentioned any weapon. You got the belt buckle of truth. You got the breastplate of righteousness. You got the helmet of salvation. You got the shield of faith to knock off the fiery darts of the enemy. And finally, you got a sword. Now, you're ready. Right? You fight darkness with the word of God. And you can't fight if you don't know the word of God. It looks like this. You see? You see what Paul has done? Paul has completed a Roman centurion's armor. He has made you a warrior. And nine times out of ten, this is where our spiritual warfare sermon ends. We tell people to put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the shield of feet, or oh, it's peace, sorry, or oh, oh, the shield of faith, sorry, and the feet of peace. But is that really where this ends? If this is all you take with you, you can do great things. You can do good things. You can engage in spiritual warfare. You will be well protected. 
But I want to ask you one more time. If it's about time, if Jesus is really about to come, And if there are really still temples of Artemis out there in your families, in your churches, in your communities, in your workplaces, is regular warfare enough? Do you want to do miracles? Or do you want to be like Paul? and do extraordinary miracles. Because if we stop here, we have enough to hold the fort. If we stop here, we have enough to secure our salvation. If we stop here, we can hold our ground. But did Christ tell us to hold the ground or to knock down the gates of hell. I'm not interested in holding my ground. I'm interested in invading hell, knocking the gates down, and setting the captives free. And so there's one more verse that almost always gets left off this list. There's one more thing. One more thing. One more thing. And this one thing changes everything. This one thing takes us from holding our ground. This one thing takes us from holding the line. This one thing takes us across the line. This one thing takes us to invading hell's territory. Paul says, and pray in the Spirit. Listen to him. This is what takes you from miracles to extraordinary miracles. And pray in the Spirit when? When? When I'm in trouble? When I'm about to eat my haystacks? Before I do my morning devotions? Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with what? Don't tell me I've been praying and it's not been working. Don't tell me I've been praying and God's not answering my prayers. Paul says you always pray no matter if you see the answers or not. You always pray. You pray in all occasions and with all kinds of prayer. With how many kinds of prayer? All kinds of prayer. So when one prayer isn't working, you swap it up to another prayer. You pray in all occasions with all kinds of prayer. And all kinds of prayer requests. With this mind be what? alert and always keep praying for what always keep praying for all of my dreams and wishes I want to see come true always keep praying for my 401k to increase Always keep praying that I will get a raise and be able to pay off the mortgage. No. 
Oh, this is the secret, guys. This is the secret, and this is why our churches don't have power. You want power? You want to invade Artemis? You want to take down the Temple of Diana? This is how it's done. Always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. I will not have victory unless you pray for me. My prayers for myself will not be enough. When I leave here, you must remember to pray for me and pray for the circles of influence that I will be in. And when, when I leave here, I must remember to pray for you and remember the conversations I've had with you. And, 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 and I need to remember the problems that you're facing. And I need to remember you in prayer. You see, the way to go from miracles to extraordinary miracles is when God's people understand the power of prayer in each other's lives. We are so focused sometimes about getting my belt buckle on, getting my shield ready, getting my sword ready, getting my helmet set, that we're not praying for anyone else's uniform. And the big game changer is when God's people stop their selfish prayers and start praying. For each other. Who are you praying for? I want you to start thinking about it. I ask you to think about where is your Artemis. I ask you to think about where is the temple of Diana in your lives. But who has a Diana that needs to come down in their life that you know? Who are you praying for other than yourself? Who are you remembering daily? Who is it that you're going to secretly pray for and never tell them that you're praying for them, but you're just going to pray for them every day, every night. You're going to pray for them. You're never going to forget to pray for them. And you're going to secretly from the back watch God do amazing things and take down temples of pagan influence in their lives. my church, we made a covenant together when I preached on this. We made a covenant. Everyone closed their eyes. Everyone bowed their heads. And everyone thought about who else it was that they were going to pray for. And I told them, please, please, don't let the sun set. Without praying for the person that you commit to. And we're going to go into the Sabbath hours here in a little bit. And I'm going to say the same to you. Pick someone to pray for. You can pick more than one. God's putting a name before your eyes right now. Pick someone and pray for them. And before the sun goes down, don't let the sun go down without praying for them. Take a walk. Go back to your room. Sit in your car. Go where you need to go. But someone needs victory. And their prayers are not going to be enough. You know, you can know when someone's praying for you and not know who it is. I told you about my wife. I told you about her moya moya. I told you about her multiple strokes over and over again. I told you about her multiple brain surgeries. I remember sitting by her bedside for 10 days in a hospital on a metal chair, very common, very much like the metal chair you're sitting on now. Her head cut open, stitched up, her face swollen from the pressure of the skull being popped. Her unable to form a full sentence. You 
And I knew I had to get up, I had to go home, I had to feed the dog. had to call the elders and get the church ready for Sabbath. I remember it was about 1 o'clock in the morning and I still hadn't done it. I was just so exhausted sitting in that metal chair. Every part of my body hurt. And I went to God. And I looked up and I said, God, I need to pray. but I'm not sure I even have the energy for that. And God said to me as clear as I'm talking to you, get up and do what you need to do. Someone is praying for you right now. And I am hearing that prayer right now, and I'm empowering you because they're praying for you. Who is it in your life who needs their Artemis temple to come down? You see, you don't have to confront them. You don't have to come at them. You don't have to attack them. You can pray for them. You can invest in them. You can remember them today as we enter the Sabbath. And you can remember them every night in your prayers. And let each Sabbath that comes be a reminder that this Friday you made a commitment to pray for the spiritual warfare of someone else and not just yourself. I'm going to pray for you one last time. May God bring to you the name he needs victory in. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I praise God for each one of these saints. I praise God for each one of these saints who have tolerated me, who have listened to me, who have come out to these meetings, who have attended my preaching class, but Father, right now I ask you to bring a name to their face, a face to their head, a face into their mind, a deep conviction of someone who needs their prayers, someone that they're going to covenant with you. Yes, they will get into their armor. Yes, they will prepare for their armor. Yes, they will go to war, but let them pray for somebody else's armor. Let them pray for somebody else's war. And may someone choose them today to pray for as well. May we covenant with you and never break this covenant until we see that temple come down. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for your time with me this week. <laughs>